Hey there everybody, Kay here from the Late Bloomer Homestead, back over at Bamboo Oasis with my friend Daryl, who's had a great idea for a video. And we are doing 10 reasons every gardener should grow heirlooms. Daryl has laid out all of his materials. He's gonna show you, I'm gonna turn it over to him. But be sure that you watch till the end of the video because we are going to go out when the wind dies down. We're going out and I'm going to show you, he's going to show you his new teepee trellis. Not teepee. His new pea trellis. Oh, yeah, yeah, snow pea trellis. Teepee trellis. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to uh, show you his new trellis that he's made out of bamboo to grow uh, snow peas. And so... Uh, turns out uh, he's going to have a gift for me. We're going to celebrate my birthday early today while I'm here, while my friend, friend Teresa's here. Denise, our pal, is going to be joining us later. There's, there it is. That's your trellis laying out there. Oh, my goodness. Fantastic. Kit. So he's <laughs> made me a kit for my own, and he's, we're going to be talking about that, and I'm going to show you. So be sure you watch till the end, and I'm going to turn it over to Daryl. And he's going to tell you what's, what, what he thinks about heirlooms, right? We're going to learn all about heirlooms and a few other things. Hello, fellow gardeners. Today we're going to talk about heirlooms and a few other things that confuse people a little that are related to heirlooms. Um, but I'm going to give you 10 reasons why you should not just be growing heirlooms, but you should be excited to be growing heirlooms. This is something that's, uh, uh, it's an aspect of gardening that to me is the most interesting aspect of gardening. You know, it's always fun to plant some seeds and harvest a crop and get to eat what you grow. That's a big thing with gardening. But when you venture into seed saving, you have joined a club. A club that has existed for thousands of years, 12,000 years, maybe more because that's what people have always done that gardened. You, you grow something and you, you save those seed and, and then you plant again next year. That has been going on for eons, okay? And that's how we came up with the, a lot of the varieties we have. Just individuals in their gardens can be doing genetic work on different plants and make a huge difference. I've done it myself. I'll be talking to you about it in a little bit. And it can take a lifetime. You know, mine has. I'm, I'm still doing it. I'm still involved in it. And so it's, it's a real exciting part of gardening. But before we can get into those 10 reasons, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page, that everybody has a basic understanding of these terms that you encounter when you look through a seed catalog. Okay, and you're trying to figure out what seed you should buy, what, what's the best kind, and so forth. Some of the things you're going to see are the word hybrid, or maybe just the letter F with a one beside it. Okay, you might see open pollinated. You might see heirloom. You might see non-GMO mentioned on seed packets. I'll be, that's kind of a silly one, but I'll talk about that. Um, here, here's what you need to know. The basic is when you look in a seed catalog, there are only two categories that are available to you, okay? you're either going to be buying an open pollinated seed, which is what seeds were forever in the old days. It was just seeds that, you know, you plant something, you grow it, you save those seed, and it'll produce that same thing for you again the next year reliably. And that's what all seeds were <laughs> till just recently, you know, a few decades back. I'll talk about that. But so open pollinated, those are, those are, plants that you can keep the seed from and grow from year to year, okay? Whereas a hybrid is where they've taken two different open pollinated things and they've crossed them to come up with something totally new and different, maybe better than either of the parents. It, sometimes it works out that it really makes something unusual. And so that's what a hybrid is. Now, if you save those seed and plant those, if you, know, if you, if you buy hybrid seed and plant them, you'll get what, what the, the packet told you you would. But if you save those seed that you produced that year, you don't know what you're going to get the next year. It might look like one of the parents. It might not. It might look like a, a bit of a mixture. Uh, you might get a few of what you actually wanted coming through. You know, you never know what you're going to get because that's just how genetics work. I, I'm going to try not to delve deep into genetics, but you know, 
knowing a little basics of it is, is helpful as a gardener. So anyway, let me just explain these, okay? Um, there's nothing wrong with growing hybrids, okay? They, I mean, in fact, a lot of hybrids are, are created to give you more disease resistance. So primarily, that's the ones that they, they've worked with. Uh, or, you know, it ha might have some other qualities that are good for you and where you live. And it has a, it's a super sweet tomato that, you know, you like or, or whatever. Um, it's okay to grow hybrids, but you're just going to have to buy those seeds every year if you want to keep growing that. You can save those seeds, but you're not going to get what you want the next year, okay? So that's the deal about hybrids. You're shelling out money every year, okay? And with open pollinated, you save your own seed. Um, and so where does heirloom come in? What's that? Well, heirloom is a special category of open pollinated seeds, okay? And what heirlooms are is it's seeds that can be traced back far into the past, you know, you might hear somebody say, oh, yeah, my, my great-grandmother used to grow these beans, and I'm still growing them in my garden. You know, I mean, Kay has a, a bean that she's keeping alive that's been in her family for generations, okay? That is, is what qualifies it as an heirloom. Also, if there's an unusual or interesting story that goes with these seeds, that can help make it an heirloom. Now, there is no exact cutoff date, like, you know, before this date, you know, it's heirloom. If not, you know, it's not. It's not that clear cut. There is no real true agreed upon definition of an heirloom. Okay, some people say it has to be at least 50 years old. You got to be able to go back 50 years. Well, let's, let's just really quick go over our agricultural history. Okay, the recent agricultural history. We came out of, like I said, we've always grown open pollinated seeds. Everybody saved their own seeds and traded and gave to friends. And, you know, that's been going on for generations, you know, thousands of years. Um, but in the, um, after World War I, the chemicals that they used for chemical warfare, those companies had invested a lot of money to make those chemicals and now the war was over. So they needed a use for those chemicals. And that became the beginning of our chemical agricultural adventure <laughs> where we, we use chemicals to nurture the plants instead of manure from animals or you know that's the way it's always been done throughout history and we made a radical change okay we also in about the 1950s a lot of these seed companies you got to remember it, during the great depression a lot of people were gardening just so they'd have food to eat during world war ii we were encouraged to grow victory gardens to help out in the war effort come on everybody grow some of your own food help us out here and a lot of people jumped into gardening that had not been into it before you know maybe their grandma did it maybe even their parents did it but they they kind of had let it slide well now they got back into it so in the 30s and the 40s these seed companies that were already established and all they they really had a swell in business over those decades and they started venturing out a little more it's it's a bit of an investment in time to to create new hybrids just a lot of experiments a lot of failed experiments it takes a while maybe to come up with what you want but they had the money now to do that and hire people to do that and so after the 1950s you'll notice that the seed catalogs start filling up with different kinds of hybrids you know and there's as you look at catalogs today there are lots of hybrids available and they're always coming out with new ones okay so there's nothing wrong with them, it's just you can't save those seed and reliably get what you started out with. Um, so some people say we should go back 100 years to call it an heirloom because then there's, no, there's not going to be any hybridization happening, there's no chemical use and, and things like that. So, you know, there, but like I said, there is no agreed upon thing. It's just heirloom is something that's very old and has a history and has been passed down for generations in a family perhaps or, or whatever. So that's what we're talking about today, heirlooms. And here's why I think everyone should be growing them. The very first reason and the biggest one I think, and it's what got me started with heirlooms was, I don't have to buy seeds anymore. Why well, buy seeds every year when I can grow that crop and if I pay attention and do it right, I can save those seed and keep them for next year and do it again. And I have done that with a lot of things I don't buy many seeds anymore unless I want to try something new out um, and I'm, I'm always trading for seeds I like to go to seed exchanges and things and uh, you know I come up with new things that way so um, <clears throat> anyway I'll just briefly mention sometimes you'll see a seed packet and it'll say uh, non-gmo seed 
Well, they're kind of playing on your ignorance there. I mean, you see, we didn't start messing with the GMO thing until I guess it was maybe in the 90s, where, and GMO means genetically modified organism, okay? It's a genetically engineered plant, which means they're not just crossing the old way we always did, okay? This is a whole new thing, and it takes a lot of money and big facilities and a lot of time and investment of time and money to, to come up with this thing that is, you know, very specific to maybe a fertilizer it has to use, you have to use with it, or an herbicide you have to use with it, which the company also sells along with the seed. And they, you know, this is for commercial big time operations. That's what they invested all that money for. They're getting farmer, big farmers to grow this corn or soybean or whatever they have changed by genetically modifying it. So there are no seeds that are being sold to home gardeners. Because these companies want to, and maybe they will in the future, I don't know, but they want to keep control of this thing that they created. They want to make money off of it every year. They don't want anybody taking it and maybe, you know, crossing it and coming up with something on their own that's similar or whatever. So, you know, they keep track. They go out and inspect the farms, and, you know, farmers get in trouble if they try to save that seed. They're, they're supposed to not do that. they got to buy seed every year. So, there, is, there are no home gardener seeds that are GMO seeds, okay? So if you see a packet that says non-GMO seed, it's just silliness, okay? There was no point writing that on there. All right, so that was the first reason, seed independence. You can keep growing it forever all by yourself. Another great thing about heirlooms is that the more you grow it on your property each year, the more that plant will acclimate to your specific area, your microclimate, whatever, it, it tunes in to where it grows and, and, you know, it'll thrive better after it's been grown there a while. You know, when you buy seeds from a catalog, you have no idea where that was grown. You, I mean, who knows? Different, thing, different places, different years when you buy it. You know, who knows where it was grown? If they grew it in Michigan and, and you try to grow it down in Alabama with the hot, humid nights and all, maybe, it might not do well, even though it thrived great up in Michigan. So, you know, it's better to get your seeds locally from other people in the area or a seed exchange that happens in your area. You can get a lot of local seeds that way. That gives you a head start on acclimating to your specific piece of property. So that's a pretty cool thing that you don't get when you buy hybrids. You just, who knows where it was grown and who knows how well it'll do in your area. You're just taking a chance. So, all right. The other thing, number three, is that once you have this seed, you can improve it over time. You can do your own genetic work and you can make this better. You know, I mean, just think about back in the old days, you know, people didn't know about DNA or, you know, genetics much, but, but they knew that that one pepper plant over there compared to all the others, look, it's, those peppers are twice as big. I'm going to save my seed from that. I want big peppers. That's the start of it right there. That's all it takes. Is you, you being observant for some trait that you desire, and you look for it, and you keep those seeds only, and grow those, and then next year you might get more of that, and you save those seeds, and okay? And eventually you can turn it into something completely different, which I'll go into in a minute, that I have done, and still I'm doing, with a sweet corn that I got three decades ago. Um, okay, number four, heirlooms, you got to remember now, heirlooms, they're old. These things were grown a long time ago, back when there were no chemical fertilizers, where people, they just did what they could with manure, and, you know, the soil quality might not have been up to par, like, like you could make it happen nowadays with chemicals, and, and, and so these crops can do better on marginal soils. All right. I mean, I'm into gardening and, you know, I put manure on my beds and all, and, and I would love to every year put a good coating of manure on every single one of my beds, but I never get that done. I do some. There may be some beds out there that haven't had manure, manure put on for three years, four years, but I've done it for so many years. My soil is, is built up enough that things do good. Plus I'm growing heirlooms that don't demand a high fertilizer dose or anything. So that's important, you know, um, for home gardeners, especially if you're starting out and making a homestead and starting a garden in a place where there never was one, you know, or something, the heirlooms would be better seeds for that. Okay, 
Number five is you're, you're tapping into some, well, some of you may be tapping into some family heritage. Like I mentioned, Kay has that, that seed that's in her family for generations. Well, that's a bit of responsibility that has fallen upon her shoulders now because... Wild goose peas. Wild goose peas, okay. And uh, so she feels a bit, you know, pressed to keep this going. I mean, her family has done this for a long time and wouldn't it be crazy for her to be into gardening and not keep that one going at least? So, you know, you, you, you're, you're, you're tapping into your family heritage and, and doing something that's going to last for generations. You can give this to your children and grandchildren, and that's how it's always worked, you know, and we need to be doing that. Starting a heritage. If right. You to, yeah. Absolutely. You could say, well. Start your own heritage. Yeah. Um, like I could do with this sweet corn or something, you know. Right. It's a new thing. All right. Um, number six reason. Uh would be to um, you become a seed supplier all right you're just a, a little person just a little old me out here doing some gardening but if you pay attention and you gather your seed and you grew enough of them like well I'll talk about that in a minute uh, you know you can end up with a large quantity of seed that you can then share with people you know give to friends and relatives you could sell it you can start a small business online or you know whatever and sell seeds and make a little money off of your garden it's an option okay number seven um, it's a way that if let's say you had a, a you know a lima bean or something that you really liked and you'd started out with about 20 seeds that somebody gave you and then you grew it and, and you liked it and you, you saved a lot of seed, you had a lot more. And after a few years, you have saved enough of this lima bean seed that you, you know, you're filling up a 55 gallon drum or you know, something like that. You are in a position now to plant huge fields of this lima bean. Now, I, I know most of us aren't going to go that way with it, but you could. Uh, or you could be selling large quantities of these seeds to other big gardeners or whatever. But, you know, it's a. Uh, you could build up a large quantity of seed without spending a lot of money. If you were going to buy a field's worth of, of lima beans from a company, it, it's going to cost you quite a bit. So you can do that for free. Number eight would be you are helping humanity by keeping rare seed varieties alive. Okay, I mean, it used to be that a lot of people gardened and everybody was growing different things and, and, and you know, things didn't tend to disappear forever, you know. Somebody had that, oh, you remember that purple pea? Yeah, I know somebody over there that grows that, you know. You can always still find it out there maybe. Uh, but that's not the case now. Do you realize that the seed catalogs that we look at now, if we were back in, in the year 1900 and we looked at a seed catalog, there would be so much more to choose from. In fact, since 1900, we have lost 90% of the crops that were available then. We've just let them go. They're gone forever. Nobody has them anymore. You know, I, I remember back when, when I first started gardening, I, I had this strawberry plant called um, Sunrise. And it, it made a very small conical shaped strawberry that was very soft. There's no way you could box it up and ship it. You know, it would not make it. It was for home gardeners. It had an amazing taste and the sweetness was just through the roof. It was such a good strawberry. And when I moved from that farm, <clears throat> I didn't bother to dig some of them up and take them along because I thought I'd just buy some more next time. I could never ever find them again and I've never had them since. And I've never had a good strawberry like that since. Nothing that good. So, you know, we have lost a lot of things. So if you plug in, if you join this club of seed saving, uh, you are helping keep rare things from disappearing forever. Keep it alive. Okay, so that's a very important reason to grow heirlooms. Something beyond yourself and your garden. It's for the greater good for humanity. I mean, a lot of people could grow it in the future. All right. And, and you know, speaking again about when we were all home gardeners, or so many people were, not everybody was buying seed from catalogs or a certain a few big companies or whatever you know they were getting seeds passed down or given to them from neighbors or whatever that that was mostly how it happened and so as a nation we had incredible diversity out there in our vegetable 
you know, choices. There, there were so many different, so many different things. And, and nowadays, you know, it's, it's much less. And so, and that's not good. You know, if, if everybody's growing the same kind of sweet corn, pretty much, because that's what, you know, people, most people, I assume, just walk in and go to one of those little seed rack displays in Lowe's or Tractor Supply or someplace. And, and you know, it's a big company and whatever corn or beans or peppers or whatever they're selling, it's that same seed being sold all over America. The whole country's got that same seed. And a lot of people, that's what that's their source, and they're buying, and that's what everybody's growing. That's not much diversity when you consider how it used to be when almost everywhere it was something different. So another big reason right there. And number 10, and then I want to show you some things and talk a little more about heirlooms and a little about catalogs. But um, number 10 is you would also, by growing heirlooms, and especially when you first start out and you have to purchase them, you're helping a lot of small seed companies that are springing up recently to kind of fight this giant agribiz takeover of all of our food. And they're trying to keep the heirlooms alive. And so that's what their company's all about, selling primarily heirloom seeds. Well, we should be supporting those companies, okay? That's, that's we need more of that. And then I, I had one little bonus thing I'll mention here, maybe an 11th reason. Uh, but like I noticed with my corn, uh, being uh, as it is a, a, an, an heirloom variety, um, there's a lot of genetic variation in it, okay? And so, you know, in the size of the ears, and how many ears are on a, on a stalk, and, and things like that. And that's what I've been playing with and, and selecting for and changing. I'll, I'll tell, you, tell you about it in a minute. But... Uh, <clears throat> I've noticed with hybrids, I, a couple years I, I did go out and buy some hybrid corn and, and try to grow it. And in my normal beds, of course without chemical fertilizer, I'm, I'm grow strictly organically, and they just didn't do very well. <laughs> really, I, they, they didn't thrive, okay? I think that, that they're used to the high dose fertilizers and chemical fertilizers and stuff that, you know, my corn produces just fine in, in less soil. So. Uh, but that it's that natural variation that's in there that, that is interesting to me because it, there's more to pick from if you're <clears throat> trying to do something to change that plant. You know, maybe you want to make it come on early. It takes 70 days for that corn to get ready. Maybe you'd like to move that up to 65 or 60. Well, how would you do that? Well, you grow the corn and the first few ears you notice that ripen first, you tie a ribbon around them or whatever, make sure you don't eat those, you save those for seed, and that's the only seed you're gonna plant next year was from the earliest years. And if you do that consistently year after year after year, it will change. You will have, almost all of them will be coming that early. You can move it up a couple days and then a couple more and you know, eventually make a big change in it. And so let me, let me start there, I guess. I, I have some different things I can talk about here, but this is my sweet corn and I, I, you know, there's not a whole lot of a story behind this, but it is an heirloom. And when I was very young, or I guess I was in my 30s maybe, uh, I went to a seed exchange and I met an old farmer from Georgia. And he had these little ears of corn. They were three, maybe four inches long. And he said, you know, a lot of people, he, he was having trouble trading the seeds because he had some ears there to show people what it, what it will do. And people weren't interested because it was so tiny. Why bother? But he, he, I ended up talking to him for a while, and, and he said, look, I'm, I'm just telling you, this is the sweetest sweet corn you're going to come across. And, and yes, the ears are tiny, but it's worth it. Wait, so I traded him, you know, whatever seed I had at the time, probably some gourds back then. I was into gourds a lot. So uh, we traded, and, you know, I, I grew it, and I agreed with him that that, that was about the, at that time, that was the sweetest sweet corn I'd ever tasted. You know, people were into... Silver Queen and th Silver Queen tastes like cardboard compared to that. I, I'm, I'm serious. I mean, it, it, this is sweet, sweet corn, okay? And there are new hybrids now that are super sweet. And I, I, I have to admit defeat. There are a few hybrids that beat the taste of the sweetness of this. And that's another thing. They're selecting for su super high sweetness or they're making hybrids to make it super high sweet but they're not necessarily retaining the flavor of the corn. You know, they're all about the sweetness. Plus you gotta buy the seeds again. Yeah, and of course you gotta, yeah, right. 
But, but you know, this corn and, and a lot of the heirlooms, they were selected because they tasted so good or, or they produced so much or, you know, they could handle a, a, a light frost or, you know, the various reasons that people retained and kept growing these seeds. But one of them is they taste great. Yeah. Okay. And some of these modern ones, they, they, it's like they don't count that as being as important. So anyway, what happened with my corn is I started growing it and eating it and liking it. I didn't like how little the ears were, but after a couple years of growing it, I noticed that, you know, there's a few ears out there that are an inch longer or, or so. And so I started my selection process. I'm going to grow bigger ears. I'm going to select for the biggest ears and I never would eat those. They'd get marked and kept. And Really, after about five years, you know, certainly by ten years into it, I was I was definitely seeing a big difference. They, my ears were getting longer consistently, you know, throughout the crop. And about that time, and about ten years into it, all of a sudden, the, these plants that always just gave me one ear started popping out two. And and a few years after that, I even had some with three, but the third one was always a lot smaller than the, the top two. But I would always save those seeds. And so what I've done now for the maybe the past 15, 20 years is when I plant the corn, I'll plant a row of double ear plants, say, you know, that I got off a plant that had two ears on it, two full good size ears. And then beside it, I'll plant a row that it might've just been a single ear on, on a, a plant, but it was big. And I put, so I got bigness and doubleness side by side. And then I might do a row of triple ear just to get that in there too. And then I'd repeat that. And so I want those pollens to mix and I want to see what happens and, and keep selecting for what I want. I ultimately would like to have three big ears on each plant. Can I ask, um, so how do you, are you going to talk about how you uh, save them separately in jars or how do you... The, the, the oh no, it's easy. Corn is so easy. Okay, so you do have to you know keep track of things. So like when I uh, when it's time to harvest the seed corn that I've left out, I let it on the vine or on the stalk until it turns brown, and which was a bad idea this year because some critter came in and ate almost all my seed corn at the last minute. Didn't bother it during the season. We had oh, to eat lots dry? of. It, it was, was dry corn. It was deer. Deer came in and and they only left me two ears for seed, so I didn't make a, a big change last year. A little bit, but um, so you know. I'll go out and I'll say, okay, I'm going to go out and harvest all the single ear plants that I've marked and take all the single ear ones off and I put them in a bag or a box or a basket or whatever and I mark it. Large single ears. Then I go out, okay, all the ones that are, there's two good ones on a plant. Then I'll put that in a separate, I, I keep these things separate so I know this came off a double ear plant, this came off a triple ear plant, this came off a giant single ear plant. Okay. And then I, I can keep track of it that way. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I have changed this corn so much during my lifetime now, 30, 35 years I've been doing this, and it, and it never had a name, you know, the guy, well, we've grown this in my family for at least four generations back before me, is what he told me, okay, and so, you know, this is a 200 year old, at least corn, a good good heirloom, and but it had no name. And since I changed it so much from little dinky things to really respectable corn now, uh, I kind of lent my name to the name I gave it. And so I call it Sweet Luck, Early Yellow Sweet Corn. And Sweet uh, Luck? Sweet Luck. Yeah. You know, my last name, Luck, and you know, so yeah. wh whatever. Yeah. And, and so I have distributed this around quite a bit intentionally at, at seed exchanges and giving it to people and, and things like that. I want this corn to be grown a lot of places. This should not be lost, okay? In fact, this bag right here is yours, Kay. Wonderful. Uh, you said you wanted a quart jar. I filled a quart jar. And that's it right there. Wow. So Fantastic. that's that's your start. And now see, Kay is in getting something from me that I've worked on for 30 or 35 years, but she could continue, if she wants, the same work I'm doing. Or we could pass it on to a 20-year-old person who could pick up where I left off and keep doing the same genetic work and get bigger ears and three years for sure and that would be awesome. you know th this can continue and I'm telling you it is easy and you notice a change within just a few years you'll see results so you know it, it's a fun part of gardening to do that I, mm -hmm. I, I you know I, I did a cool thing for myself and 
gosh, for humanity now, I mean, that is a good sweet corn. I don't suppose you kept in touch with that guy. No, I sure didn't. No, nope, that's the only time Wouldn't I ever saw him. Would he be amazed? Yeah, yeah, he would be to see the years now. He would be. I... Some of my heirlooms I got about three years ago at a seed exchange. And this one here is interesting. This is, uh, this is called Red Calico um, Butter Bean. And it's a pole bean. you got to grow it on a trellis. Uh, but this one has been traced back to 1794. That's all the information I have about it. Just that it's, you know, it was passed down in someone's family and they know it goes at least back to 1794. Do you like it? Does it taste good? Well, that's a good question you ask. Um, I got my original seed. This is my original thing I got from the seed exchange. Red calico. Just lay it right here so I can Butter see. bean, okay? Uh -huh. And that is about half of the seeds that I had that they gave me. I had twice as many. So what I do when I'm trying to something new I never had before, and especially mm -hmm. that I can't easily replace if I mess up, I only plant half the seeds. Right. In case I have a bad year, I can mm -hmm. try again next year. Right. Well, what happened is this amount of seeds mm -hmm. produced this amount of seeds. Okay. I did not eat a single one because I watched this thing grow and I was blown away at how productive it was. There were so many pods hanging all over. I said, man, this is giving me some lima beans. And you see that it did. Just that many seeds made that many. So I haven't even tasted it yet because I wanted to make a bunch of seeds. Wow. Now this year I'll taste it for the first time. I'm sure I'm going to like it. You know, good lima. I like lima beans. Well, I hope but, you got some for me. And there's your packet oh, right fantastic. there. Fantastic. That gives you, that's at least double what I started with. So I'm wow. sure you can do well. Fantastic. All right. And see, that's see, one of the cool things. I grew an heirloom. I produced a whole bunch of seed. And now I got, I can give them away to friends. I got plenty. That's right. It's a pretty cool thing. All right. Let's look at... Oh, and by the way, here's some more miracle fruit seed for you, too. Oh. Maybe you can try again and get lucky. Yeah. I got one little sprout, but... Here's one that I traded for called... It just says Butterbean Granny Mead, Tennessee. That's all I know about it. I know that it, they said it was an heirloom, but they can't... There's no story with it or a date or anything like that. No. Nope. Yeah, they're pretty. I haven't grown these. This is I got them three years ago. I got so many I got so many bean seeds at that at that seed exchange that I, I'm still trying some out for the first time three years later. You know, I mean I, I keep growing a What few is more. it about beans that you're so I, well, they're easy to keep seed from. Yeah. They're absolutely delicious when you eat them fresh. And you can can them or dry them, and like you know, it's so cook them easy up as to dry dried beans. Yeah, so easy to dry. Yeah, it's just a good food crop because yeah. you know it'll carry you through the winter easily. You can store them so easily when they're dry; it's nothing to it. But I love it all. I love them fresh more than you know any. I yeah. just love to eat them right off the you know while I cook them. But um, okay, what was? But that? now the limas. Do you, do you eat the pod? No. Oh, okay. No, you just gotta the beans. you gotta pop them out of there. Okay. Yeah, you know, all of them have to be taken out. Okay. Okay. Then I got here, I've got, well, here's one. It just said, it's just, it's nothing really. It's just a white looking bean, but it says on the tag, it's an heirloom bean called the White Half Runner. And it's from the Pineville area of Kentucky. Okay. It says the pod turns reddish as they mature. So, you know, I know it was, I'm in Tennessee. This was grown in Kentucky. I got a head start on it being acclimated to my area. So that was a good one. I haven't grown that before. I might. See. I want to try all these. I'm going to grow this year. I'm going to try some of these up for the first time. What does this say when it's a half runner? What does that mean? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know why they call it half runner. But okay. I don't know. Maybe half as tall. Not Mine's really. I mean, I, I grow scarlet half runner, and it grows like all the other climbers. Hmm. So I don't know. And then this one's a really cool. Now these are all heirlooms. This is an heirloom, but it has no story or date with it. But I just. <laughs> I just think the seeds are so cool looking. It's called oh, yeah. Seneca Speckled Egg. It looks like a speckled uh, egg. They're beautiful. I, you know, I, I'm growing this bean because it's so cool looking. But now this is half what I started with. So I didn't have very many. See, I only had like a dozen seeds to start with or something. And I planted half of them last year and they didn't, that didn't do good. I can't remember how it failed, but they mm -hmm. failed. 
So this is my last chance. I'm going to plant these seeds this year, and if they don't make it, I, I'll lose the Seneca speckled egg. Oh, dear. Because that's all I have. And then this is a cool one I got. This is the Hopi Orange Lima. And I, I actually, shortly before you got here, I looked this up on the computer. I wanted to see if I could learn something about its history. And the oddest thing that I found, it's a bush lima, and it gets four to six feet tall. Wow. I thought that was just really different and strange, and it's really good and, huh? Is this all you have? That's all I have, so, but next year, hopefully, I can provide you with some. Okay. Um, so I'm going to try that out, and it's supposed to do really good in hot, dry conditions. Okay. So that's kind of a cool thing. Yeah. So that'll be a fun one to play with. And then this one, now this is, this is like, this is what they mean by heirloom. Okay. Okay, this is a true heirloom. All right. Now first, take a look. This is the one you saw a picture of earlier. I had these laid out. It's yes. A pretty, it's a very pretty bean. This is Anasazi. Yeah. Okay, Anasazi bean. Now, the history, the, this is what, the story is what's so interesting with this. Here's the story that makes it the heirloom. They found this in Colorado, mm -hmm. digging around in the Anasazi you know, settlement. settlement that's left over there. You know, that's where they dug the holes in the cliffside and made yeah. little houses and that kind of thing. So they this was buried under soil, maybe inside one of those, and that's how it stayed so dry. Mm -hmm. And in this clay pot that they found were these seeds, and they were viable. They, they carbon dated the, the clay pot to the year 1400. Mm -hmm. So these seeds have been sitting in a clay pot dry underground since 1400. Well, not these particular ones. These no, well, not these, but the ones that that's what they started yeah, with. They, yeah. they planted these right, old right. seeds. Right, right. And, and now we have, now they're around and anybody can get them pretty much, you know. That's right. So um, that, that's just so so neat to be growing something that's that ancient, you know. Yeah, I just wonder how we, how we had so many heirlooms back in the day. There were much fewer people. So how did, how did they have so many varieties? Where did all these seeds come from? Well, that's the thing. And, and that's, you know, every gardener, you can go to whatever level you want with gardening, right? I mean, you can just plant the seeds, harvest the stuff, and do it again next year. You know, that's okay. You know, but it's more fun if you delve in a little deeper and learn about some of this stuff. So back in the old days, I'm sure there were plenty of gardeners that did, yeah, we just plant it and we harvest it, no big deal. You know, yeah, you save some seeds because you want to be able to plant them next year. But they didn't put any effort into selecting for traits or doing anything like that. Mm -hmm. But surely among the old folks back then mm -hmm. were some that were a little more interested in things, a little more curious, a little more mm -hmm. willing to put the time in. And so they were our true geneticists altering our crops. And then, of course, they they might have come up with something that's new and, and they start spreading it around and they catch everybody likes it and everybody's giving it to everybody and I, I saw a book yesterday in an antique store. It was the architectural record of nineteen twelve. Okay. <laughs> and I thought I should really buy that and see what it says. The print is probably eight point type, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Old volume. So do you want to show that book that? That's um, oh, I wanted. Oh, that's the one other thing I wanted to do was just quickly go over what you encounter when you go to a seed catalog and you're looking for seeds. All right, you're going to see different things. It'll have the name of the crop. It might say right behind it hybrid, or it might say hybrid F1, or it might just say F1. Mm -hmm. F1 stands for filial. Uh, filial is a, like a Latin word it means son or daughter. Okay, so the, oh. the F1 means the first, so these would be the first sons and daughters, basically, yeah. the first generation of this cross, mm -hmm. okay? And that's, that's what they sell as a hybrid. So mm -hmm. you might just see F1. Well, that tells you that's a hybrid, mm -hmm. okay? Not a bad thing, but, you know, it's not an heirloom. It's not something you can save seed from. Mm -hmm. You might look in the catalog and see one here. I'm looking at a page of cucumbers, you know, and so there's three F1s in a row. The next one I look at, it doesn't say anything at all about it, you know. Well, when that's the case, that, that is an open pollinative variety. If they don't designate it at all, if it's a hybrid, they're gonna tell you it is. Mm -hmm. If they don't tell you anything, it's an open pollinator, you can save the seed from it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they will even, the next one down says OP mm -hmm. for open pollinated. So mm -hmm. you know for sure that's open pollinated. I don't know why they don't do that, just, you know. I the think they one. probably 
do a lot of hybrids for cucurbits because so many diseases, you know. Oh, right, right. So, you know, you, you encounter these different words and, you know, some catalogs, uh, you know, this one's strictly going with F1 or nothing. Uh, some of the others, they'll, 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 they'll make sure you see that this is an heirloom. Italian heirloom, Argentinian heirloom. Uh, you know, this one, this is uh, pine tree seeds. They grow, they sell a lot of heirloom Let, seeds. Let's see the cover. The cover. Let me see the cover. Uh, right. I haven't heard of that one. Oh, pine tree. Okay. Pine tree, yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, they sell hybrids too, but they have a lot of heirlooms. Okay. So it, it's a good catalog. How many catalogs do you re receive on a yearly basis? Well, Darryl? I used to get when I was be buying on, seeds. Be regularly. honest. <laughs> when I was buying seeds regularly, I probably got 20, 25 different catalogs coming in here. And this is before Baker Creek and all those newer ones. Yeah, right? yeah. It, <clears throat> but now, like I said, I. I they don't keep sending them to you if you don't order from them. No. So, you know, now I, I order from a few and I get their catalogs. Johnny's and Pine Tree, Shumway. Uh, what's this one here? That is high mowing organic seeds. High mowing seeds, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I still get a few because I do, I might order one or two packets of something new. I, I still do that. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, you that know, book. just... Just, just show that book for a second. We picked that oh, book yeah. up the other day at, I think it was at Goodwill, and Teresa thought I should have it, Cooking with Heirlooms. And uh, I don't know why, you know, what would be the difference of cooking with heirlooms and cooking with hybrids, but uh, well, I guess we'll have to Then you would know that that taste that you're enjoying right now is what your great-grandmother was tasting. Yeah. Right? I mean, you know, if it was, or if it was mm -hmm. in your family anyway. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this is... You know, like these lima beans here, this is what a lot of people were eating in the late 1700s. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and through the 1800s, this, this was it's interesting a popular though, bean. It's interesting, though, uh, neither of my grandparents grew a red lima bean. Uh-huh. I mean, we, when we ate the lima beans, they were always white. Oh. Or, or, uh -huh. or, or, or light green. Light green, yeah. 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 You know. And well, uh, actually, they call that a butter bean. I don't know. I don't really know what the difference between a butter bean and a lima bean. I think a butter bean and a lima bean is kind of the same thing, isn't it? Yeah. I thought so. They yeah. taste about the same. Yeah. So anyway, there you go. All right. Well, why don't try we... Try to grow heirlooms. Yeah. Try to grow heirlooms because yeah. you're helping everybody when you do. That's right. All of humanity. That's right. It's for the greater good. And now I'm going to take you down and we're going to have a look at my snow pea trellis and talk a little bit about snow peas. I'm growing four different open pollinated varieties. Two in the spring planting, two in the fall planting. Well, we'll talk about it when we get down there. I was in my garage a while back and I found this stuff that I probably bought about 20 years ago. It, you know, it's, it's not plastic. I don't know what, it, they said it, you know, it just, it doesn't degrade and it lasts forever or whatever. I, I'm not sure what it is. It feels like plastic, but yeah. they say it's not. So anyway, uh, I had a roll of that. And, and bought it probably 20 years ago and just stuck it back in the corner and never used it. And so I, I, I find this and it's like, yeah, I could make a nice trellis out of that, you know. And I, I wanted more trellis space to grow snow peas. And of course, if I'm building anything, I think bamboo first, you know, to see if I could possibly make something out of bamboo instead of anything else. And I thought, well, this is perfect for bamboo. This is perfect. Mm -hmm. All I need is three tripods. And this is one long 20-foot pole uh, on the... On the kit I'm giving to Kay, there's two 10-foot poles, so they will meet at her her center uh, tripod, but whatever. And so, you know, with a few zip ties, and, you know, I put zip ties around. The, the zip ties weren't long enough to go around all three at once. I had to do two, and then two, and then two, let okay. you know, to Good make to that know. real secure. And then up here, just make sure everything's attached. And, and I put a few zip ties along the top to hold this, this mesh up. Mm -hmm. But I have the mesh. Notice it's it's a few inches off the ground. Mm -hmm. So in the spring, see, I'll just come in here and I'll I'll pull all this hay back enough that I can dig. I'm going to plant on both sides of this uh, hanging mesh. The foliage doesn't. To... The, yeah, the foliage doesn't block the sun. And see, the way I have my trellises, this side is gets most of the sunshine. The back side isn't really going to get much direct sunlight. I mean, it, it's better to run your if you can run your trellises. Uh, north south then the morning sun hits one side and the afternoon sun gets the other side and they both get the midday sun but 
if you can. I, because it's snow peas mm -hmm. and the growth is rather sparse really. I mean a lot of light will filter through, come through the, the, the plants on this side to, to hit the ones on that side. So I'm not really worried about it. Mm -hmm. But the cool thing about snow peas, here in Tennessee at least, and other areas south of here, maybe a little bit north of here, is you can plant the snow peas. I'm going to plant them in a few weeks now, probably late, late February. First week of March at the latest, because I want them to grow March, April, and May. By the end of May, I'll start getting snow peas, and into early June, I'll have snow peas. Mm -hmm. And that's when the potatoes come in, too, and I, I love that meal, snow peas and potatoes together. Uh, mm. uh, it's awesome. So, but then, what's cool here, because of my climate in Tennessee, as soon as I harvest the snow peas in, in the first half of June, I can dig things up and replant snow peas now for a fall crop and that late June is the perfect time Oh, because it'll be late July, late August, late September and into October. That's when you'll eat your, your fall crop. Okay. And I will say uh, for those of you who are in an area where you can do a fall crop, and my experience has been I usually get a better crop in the fall than I do in the spring and that's for things like snow peas, broccoli for sure because see with broccoli you plant in the spring and about the time that the the heads are forming you're you're moving into you know late may early june you know somewhere in there well the bug the bug pressure is amazing i mean they'll they'll just eat them up but if you plant a fall crop of broccoli by the time the heads start forming you're into late september october the the bugs are about finished with their activity mm -hmm. And so you have a lot less pressure from insects on a fall crop, I think. How do you preserve your broccoli in the fall? Do you try? No, I don't even, you know what? I, I don't like frozen broccoli. It just messes it up. Yeah. Dried broccoli, nah, nah. Yeah. And so I eat broccoli fresh. And so what happens, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I plant a long row of it because I want to make sure I have some. And when broccoli's coming in, I eat broccoli every day. That's good. Maybe twice a day. I wow. I don't want to miss out on it. Wow. And I just eat it fresh. And that's what, and if and if it goes to waste, then the chickens get it because it got buggy at the end of the season or you know yeah. whatever. Yeah. Cool. So. so now you have a kit for me. Let's go look at it. Yeah, we'll go show you. I, I got all your pieces cut. Kay's going to do her uh, her trellis a little different, in that she instead of one long line, she's going to have one come to the center. Uh, uh, tripod and then pivot at a right angle. She's going to fill in a co at a corner area. Mm -hmm. So, but it's still the same. It'll work the same way, mm -hmm. uh, especially since I cut her two separate ten-foot poles. She can do that. Mm -hmm. What I was and, really hoping to do is to have cabbages and broccoli around it, but um, I think I should have set, started the seeds already. Have you started your broccoli seeds? Uh, no, not yet. Okay. No, not yet. Okay. Uh, because you know you, you're going to set out young plants. In the early spring, right? You don't want to get 20 degree weather, or you know. So for me, you know, I, I always for around here, I focus on late April, early May, as when I'll be putting some of my first things out. That's too mm -hmm. early for tomatoes and mm, stuff like that. But you know, the early things that can take a little bit of cold, mm -hmm. late late April, early May. Okay. But the main I've got time. the main planting time for gardening here is May. And first oh, half know. of June. I know. I'm you got just... to about the first half of June, and then you have kind of missed the, the, the season. Yep. yep. Okay. So these are my poles. These are your poles. I've sharpened the one end here, so you you know a little easier to drive into the ground. It's got Great. a little point on it, and Great. I cut it right. Most of them I cut right at a node if I could. Now, you know they're they're slightly varying in length mm -hmm. because I wanted to make sure that you had a solid end cap. Otherwise, they're going to fill up with rainwater and it'll rot, you know, real easy. Yeah, so you guys, if you're using bamboo, you got to cut it right above the node so you don't have water going down in there and rotting. Yeah. I mean, so, it will so it will degrade and rot at some point anyway. Oh, yeah. It's just uh, you don't want it to do it within the first year. Okay, so I'll be taking these. Now, should, let's go ahead and put these in my truck. Yeah, and we need to bundle them up and tie them at two ends so it's one solid bundle. 